Yeah, you're live. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest webinar in our alumni webinar series. Today, we're delighted to have with us Shikhar, Gauri, and Aditya to talk about their experiences in college and what they're doing now. As always, please feel free to ask any questions you may have, and we'll pose them to the speakers at the end. Shikhar, why don't you start by introducing yourself, and then Gauri and Aditya can do the same. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Shikhar, and I graduated from TISB a couple of years ago. I'm now studying economics and data science at the University of Chicago, and I'm looking forward to answering any questions you may, guys may have, and hopefully I can add value when you guys decide to choose colleges yourself. Hi, guys. Um, my name is Gauri Samayajala. I graduated in 2017. I go to the University of California, Berkeley, and I'm in my senior year. I'm studying economics and computer science. And I'm looking forward to this webinar as well. I'm so excited to hear from you all. And please let me know if you have any questions specific to Berkeley or questions about econ in general. Thank you, Aditya. I think your audio is not very clear, um, so maybe we'll have you say the introduction again um, once you figure that out. So until then, we'll um, start with the questioning. So maybe Shikhar and Gauri can take this one. So why did both of you personally choose your college? Like why you Chicago and why Berkeley? All right. Sure. Um, I guess I can go first. So um, I've always been someone who is interested in economics and business. This was something that was something I enjoyed during high school and also during like uh, time I spent with my family and things like that. So why economics was quite clear for me. And as an international student, I was applying to a wide range of universities. I wasn't trying to be too picky about uh, I wanted universities that are a liberal arts and be that are not too small that they have enough seats to get some international students into. So that was my category while looking at it. For economics, U Chicago is kind of a no brainer, at least from my perspective. Um, uh, the number of Nobel laureates, the name recognition it holds itself was something that brought me towards it. Another aspect was I knew a lot of um, upperclassmen who had gone to U Chicago and I was, in, I was in close contact with them. So I learned a lot about Chicago and those were really my reasons. Um, I'm sure Gauri may have more specific ones, so I should chose Berkeley. Just way to put me on the spot. Um, <laughs> I, would, I would also say the same. I don't think there are any real specific reasons why I chose Berkeley, but having attended Berkeley for three years, I think I can give a like a more grounded reason as to why I'm happy here and why like this was a good school for me. So Berkeley is a larger school and it's a public university. So there are some differences in terms of like the kinds of education and what you can expect for, between like U Chicago and Stanford and Berkeley. But the quality of education is the same and the professors are absolutely amazing. And the opportunities that you have just to like reach out to these amazing, I. Just to give you an example, recently I reached out to Robert um, Robert Reich, and he's a labor econ professor, and he was the former um, labor secretary, I think, of the United States. So just being able to have those professors at such close reach, and knowing that as an econ major, I'm able to like hold conversations with them and be able to reach out with them, I think that was what really what really drew me to the school. It's just the level and intensity of academics is it's 
quite breathtaking to like behold just because I feel like I'm contributing to such interesting academic discourse and contributing to conversations where I feel like I like I just feel like I belong in the school and I think just economics in general there's such a wide variety of opinions and ha having those different perspectives and beliefs like gives you a more founded background and basis so when you enter the real world you have like more perspectives and I think Berkeley gives you all that. Awesome. Um, thank you guys so much for sharing that. And that's really insightful. So maybe Aditya, can we try your introduction? Yeah, is my, is my sound quality better now? Yes, it's good now. Awesome. Um, great. So uh, I guess let me start from the beginning. So I graduated TISB in 2011. I'd, I've been with the school for a while. So I joined in uh, sixth grade, I believe. Did the IGCSE in 2009, then the IB in 2011. Um, applied to a wide range of colleges for um, some sort of combination of computer science and economics. So was very interested in both the subjects, more so from the perspective of entrepreneurship. So I'd always kind of enjoyed building things. I'd done a lot of programming on the side, mobile app development, web development when I was in high school. But I wanted kind of that entrepreneurship angle. So major factor I was looking for when applying to colleges was obviously a very strong computer science program. and. You know, typically you think about Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, you know, Illinois has got a phenomenal computer science program, MIT. But I, I wanted a school that also had a very good liberal arts background, um, a good business. Um, and I don't mean business, but more like an economics program as well. I personally don't believe in undergraduate business. and We can, we can talk about that some other time, but I, I wanted kind of a liberal arts education with kind of that economics component and then obviously the solid uh, engineering school. So that's what led me to Stanford. I uh, applied early action. So once I got in, it was a pretty easy decision for me. It was, it was interesting. I was actually in Cambridge for my interviews the night before I, um, the night before my interviews at Cambridge, I got my Stanford admissions letter and I was like, I'm, I'm probably going to end up going here anyway. <laughs> but um, uh, does that answer the question? I guess, you know, why Stanford what, what brought me there? I think, I think overall one thing that stands out about the school is it's a very, very collaborative culture. So um, and there are a lot of top universities out there where students are very, very intelligent. You know, they're, they've got, got a phenomenal background, but uh, frankly, people don't really help each other out that much. And I don't necessarily want to name the universities because I, I didn't go there, but my perspective from Stanford at least is people help each other out. So if there's a problem set due in eight or nine hours, everyone kind of gets together in the common room. We help each other out. Um, there's a wonderful honor system. So if I worked with um, my friend Prithvi, for example, I put his name on my assignment and I can openly admit that I've collaborated with him. So that, that kind of rem removes the awkwardness from the whole process. It makes it a very collaborative learning experience and people want to help each other out. I mean, you can you can say, hey, let's get together after you know dinner and work on questions to be in for it. For some reason, I couldn't figure them out. So people like to help each other out and that makes for a very positive academic environment. In terms of professors, they're obviously um, you know, very, very well regarded. You know, anecdotally, one of my professors, he consulted for you know, De Beers Diamonds. He, he kind of designed their auction process. So um, a lot of these guys consult outside um, outside academia. They advise in industry as well. You know, John Taylor, he's a Nobel laureate. He was my introductory economics professor as well. So um, these guys are very academically renowned, but uh, they're also big in industry. So my computer science advisor, he's a full professor, but he's also kind of chief scientist at Pinterest right now. So a lot of these guys, you know, they're given the proximity to Silicon Valley, they'll end up taking on roles with tech companies in some sort of advisory capacity, or, you know, they'll take three years off, start a company, sell it to Google, and then come back as a professor. So so, so, so kind of that you know, dichotomy between Silicon Valley and Stanford is very apparent and um, you know, a huge factor in my deciding to attend the university. That is amazing to hear, and I think this, and, and I think you briefly mentioned sort of the the uh, culture of collaboration that is at Stanford, and that's something we always like to ask alumni. So maybe Shikhar and Gauri, you guys can address that as well. So at your schools, um, what is that culture like, the student culture? All right. Um, I guess I should have mentioned that when I was talking about why I chose you, Chicago. But one of the things that the school really prides itself on is this house culture system. So uh, unlike many other universities, you actually live with the people that uh, uh, kind of say the hundred people you live with um, in your apartment are people who are in a house. You eat lunch with them. You have weekly um, 
visits downtown with them, you go and eat dinner with them. So it creates a community of people who you di directly live around and those people are your like kind of like your family. So one really positive thing about U Chicago is this house system and it allows for people to be really collaborative and create this like comfortable system. Secondly, U Chicago is known quite a lot for its intellectual rigor and things of the sort. And that's why they do everything to try and make sure that that doesn't actually get to the student in a negative way. And that often means that um, in such a fast paced quarter system that we have projects that are very team work based that any kind of assignment, I haven't done anything that would just be my myself. I haven't heard of like the honor system that um, Aditya mentioned, but uh, we're quite, uh, we work together on all our assignments and things like that. From what I've asked um, when I've talked to my peers who are also in good universities, they do suggest to me that things are similar in that aspect. So I, I don't know if it's particularly unique in that aspect, but it definitely values collaboration a lot. I think my experience is different just by virtue of being in a public school. So it's it's a lot harder in that there's a lot more students. So you kind of do have to make your own friends because when you have an incoming class of 10,000, it's kind of hard to find your own way. But having said that, there are a lot of ways for you to find your own friends, which I, I've lived with the same roommates now for the past three, four years. And um, you can find friends. I think that's the that's the thing. If you're if you feel like you're more introverted and you feel uncomfortable making friends in like large environments, I don't I wouldn't I really wouldn't recommend like a large public school, but it is an amazing experience because you get to build connections and you have to find people with similar interests as you, which is kind of similar to the real world where not everyone's going to be to your taste. So, I would definitely not say that Berkeley's the like warmest school, but you can find your own friends and make your own um, like family or make your own, build your own network and community. So I think that that's how my experience differs just because we are in nature much bigger than both, you know, Shikers and Aditya schools, but you can make your own friends and I've found amazing friends there. So it's not impossible. So that was great to hear all your perspectives. So for a lot of us, college is a very, very intimidating thought in our head. So what was your expectation or idea of college before you went and how significantly did the reality differ from your idea of college life? So Gauri, you can continue and then maybe Shikhar and Aditya can take it up after. I think when you go into college, you can't have any expectations just because I think for me, I hadn't been back to the US in a long time and I had like I hadn't I hadn't ever been to California or lived in California for a significant period of my life. So I would say that just coming into California, it was like a little bit of a culture shock and that I wasn't used to like the way things that were done here and like, you know, just like how expensive are things? How do you pay for like restaurants? Like what is a tipping process? And those are things that I, I don't I don't think we think about that you know, heavily when we're going into and applying to colleges, but culture can be so different in some places. So I think that going into college with expectations is hard because what you put into it is what you get out of it. And having like a set of expectations where you say um, you expect it to look like the movies or you expect it to look like a TV show can set you up for disappointment. So I would say just go in with an open mind and don't have any like, don't form your expectations around college of what about like things that you've read online just because you don't want to disappoint yourself. I think one thing I did before I came to Berkeley was I didn't, I looked at like professors and classes I was interested in, but I never looked up to campus just so like when I got there for the first time, I didn't have any expectations of what it would look like or who, who I'd be interacting with. And having done that, I think that really helped just because it gave me a lot more like of an open minded perspective and I didn't walk into something where I expected one thing, but I got something completely different. Uh, um, personally, I think this is something that's really important and I think a lot of the intimidation that people have regarding college really stems from like really high expectations. You, everyone tells you you're going to make your friends for the rest of your life and that implicitly puts a lot of like um, pressure on you that hey well if I'm going to make all the friends for the rest of my life that I better be making friends and things like that and it all usually accumulates to making it slightly more intimidating than it needs to be. So personally, I only went to TISB all my life. So I was there for 13 years. My friend group was the same 
20 friends with people joining, leaving, blah, blah, blah. But I was around the same people, the teachers, I knew all of them. So I was very comfortable at TISB. Going to U Chicago was a really, really big change for me. And um, definitely it was a shock, less of a culture shock for me because a lot of my friends were also from the US and things like that. So I didn't feel as much of a culture shock, but more about a process of finding out who I really am when I'm not really alongside the group of friends I've had from maybe grade one, right? So um, my expectations of college were the more stereotypical. I didn't think put too much thought into like, hey, this is what I expect from college. But generally I was like, hey, I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna have a lot of fun. I'm gonna meet all my best friends. It's gonna be exactly like my school, which was amazing. And what I found was everyone has a different journey, but you definitely need to take some time to get adjusted to life in a different country, right? Going in, you're not gonna have those 20 friends who know every aspect of you. You're gonna meet new people. Um, the initial group of friends you make may not be the actual friend you have three months later, things like that. And in my, in, for my personal experience, that's not something like it was in TISV. I knew where things were. I knew where I stood and things like that. So my advice to anyone going to college would be A, do not have very high expectations with like your initial couple of months. Just try and settle down. It doesn't matter as much as other people will make it, make you feel it is. Like the first group of friends you make aren't the most important and things like that. Just settle down and then you'll start understanding how things work and you get into, into your groove. So that's my advice. Yeah, I think I think Shikhar and Gori had a lot of useful perspective there. So I'm, I'm going to be very relatively short here, but I think one thing that can certainly bridge the gap is maybe going to summer school. And I, I did that between 10th and 11th grade. Obviously, that's not an option for everyone for whatever reason, or you know, you might want to stay local and do an internship or do some kind of you know social work, which is something I did as well. But um, summer school kind of gets you acquainted with what campus like is like is like. You, know, you kind of interact with people in the US. You um, little things, right? You start handling US dollars, right? I mean, when you first come in America, you go to Starbucks, you pay five dollars for a coffee. You're just kind of you're adjusting to so many different things, right? And that's just a very kind of minor, granular daily example, but definitely summer school is a good way to get acquainted with that. Uh, I'd also gone for Model United Nations at Harvard, so spend about ten days in Boston. So doing a couple of trips out to the US can certainly make a difference. Doing a campus visit can be nice as well. It's um, bit less of a physical shock at least. Now in terms of culture, um, you, you'll find that in most college campuses people are incredibly open in, uh, in, in the US at least. At least that's what I experienced on the West Coast. Um, a lot of good universities have an Indian community. There's an Indian international student community as well. You know from Stanford for example in 2011 there were 15 of us or 15 to 20 of us going and um, one of the alums hosted this um, session in Bombay where everyone could meet each other. So I made a lot of close friends from that one kind of orientation event for the Indian International students. I'm still friends with them today, but one thing I'd strongly encourage all of you to do is I mean, don't just stick stick to the Indian group of people. I mean, just it's um, it, you know you'll find comfort in kind of hanging out with the other Indian International students. They come from a similar background and they have the same challenges as you. But um, try to broaden a little, make friends outside of that um, outside of the circle that seems easiest to and end up sticking to it for four years. And uh, especially if you want to stay in the US long term. Uh, overall, the Stanford's got a very, very diverse community. I believe about 15% of it's international. Um, it's about 20 to 30% of Stanford's South Asian or Asian. Um, it is incredibly mixed. So um, you feel like you're in a diverse campus and it's very easy to make friends and you don't really feel like you've been transported into America and that's just, that's something about California in general, by the way. I'm sure Gory can speak to that as well. Like, I, mean, I live in San Francisco now, and when I walk around, um, I guess, frankly, the white demographics just maybe what 20, 30 percent. It's just such a such a diverse mix of people. So, if you want to come to the West Coast, you'll you'll really enjoy it out here. There's a strong Indian community, and you'll meet people from other cultures as well. And that's definitely the plus side. Interesting. That's and. Um, all of your points are definitely something we do need to keep in mind, summer school and also um, sort of not having too many expectations initially and trying to make the best we can of the time that we have. Um, so maybe on a more light, light note, 
how is student life like at your college? Are school art um, sports teams and clubs a big part? And maybe what did you guys personally participate in? Okay, can you please start and then we'll go to Shikhar and Aditya. So let me start with sports. I think um, Berkeley is like a D1. So if you were into football and you're into like basketball and stuff, we have a pretty decent team. I wouldn't say it is the best team. I will say that we won against Stanford this year. I don't know if you keep up with that other day, but we finally won. It took us like seven years to win the game, but we won. We won the ax back. It was like our proudest moment <laughs> possibly ever. But um, football is pretty big. Swimming and diving in our, um, are also really big. I think our team is like the Olympics team pretty much. So we're pretty competitive in those sports. I would say there is like a big, you know, game day culture and like there are parties that you can go to if you're into that. But I would say that um, sports is important, but not super important. So don't expect like world class, you know, football or world class basketball. We're all right. <laughs> We're a public university. We, do, we make do with the funding that we have. But I will say that like you, there are hundreds of clubs on campus. The good thing about having 40,000 students means if you want to take a class on something, some student would have like started a class on it. So there's like these things called decals, which are student run classes on basically every topic you can think of. So I think they started a, a class on like the spread of K-pop and like the economic impact of BTS on the world. And the, it starts from there, or you can go into Harry Potter trivia or, if you want to start a class on something, you can as long as you find a professor to back you for it. So in terms of like activities, there is something for everyone, including a Quidditch team, which I didn't know was a thing, but you can play Quidditch apparently. And if you want it, you just have to like look for it. You can Google it and I'm sure there'll be a club for you. Um, yeah, so I would second Gary on the last point that literally anything you can think of, you can either start or join a group that exists. Um, looking at student life at UChicago, I'd probably characterize one big aspect as just the housing system. I know I mentioned it earlier, but it tends to be a very big aspect because it's for your first year. These are the people you're eating every meal with, people you spend the evenings with, you come back home to. So they become your initial kind of social life and you make a lot of friends through that. And uh, that's really positive. And there are a lot of like activities inter-house activity, so to speak, whether that's sporting, whether that's more like debate and things of the sort. So there's always something like that going on. In terms of sports, UChicago is a D3 school, so that's a very low emphasis on sports, I'll be honest. But I actually, I'm a, sports is one of my passions, along with playing to actually also like watching and things like that. And I've never felt like I'm at a school where damn, no one knows anything about sports or anything like that. But it's definitely you're not going to meet like Olympians around and that's something that you should know when coming into your Chicago. The fact that the sports teams are slightly less competitive to get into or could actually help me get a few games next year. So I, hopefully I get to go out of Bangalore for a bit and play some badminton. But uh, so that's definitely something that someone applying to UChicago should look into. Um, along with that, I think there's a big emphasis because we're not a very big university. We have about what is it, uh, 1600 students per year. So about like 7,000 students in total. And that allows you to like meet the same people really often. And I, from what I've talked to other friends of mine, that's not always common in a place like Berkeley where there's so many more people. But for me, for example, any class I take, I'll know two or three people in it just by chance. Um, and that's just because there's so few people in comparison to other places. Um, uh, student life along with that. There's a very big emphasis on more intellectual clubs kind of thing. Like we have a very big MUN team, a debate team uh, that goes around every weekend. There's a lot of U Chicago esque things that are more traditional U Chicago games, um, which involves like a very big scavenger hunt. Sorry, I don't know the details, but people absolutely love it. Um, so there's whatever you want, there's something for you. Um, I would like to mention something about Greek life here. So while I, I, I don't know how big it is in the West Coast, U Chicago doesn't actually have as big of a Greek life influence as other universities. So I think less than 10% of students here are part of Greek life. And that's increasing a lot. And if that's something you're into, you definitely can get in. It's not very competitive because a lot of people don't really, not a lot of people want to do it, but 
so that's something you should look into too. If you're someone who's really, really into Greek life, then you'll still be fine at U Chicago, but um, maybe there's a better school out there for you. Awesome, I can talk about a few things here. So uh, I guess maybe let's talk about sports and then student organizations and then Greek life in that order. So um, Stanford's pretty big on sports, actually. We uh, will have a decent amount of Olympians in every year. I, you know, I had a few friends who have Olympic athletes on their floor, you know, a few doors away from them. So uh, definitely a big emphasis on athletics as well. Um, ton of school spirit around athletics as well. So we're, you know, we're big on our football team. Um, I'll kind of give Gordy the win for last year, but I actually haven't gone to a single football game since I've been at Stanford. So I kind of live vicariously through my friends are actually following football. But um, yeah, no, we, we do well. I mean, we have a lot of athletics classes as well that you can get the college credit for. So I actually took a three quarter golf sequence and I got I got a couple of credits towards graduation. Um, you know, every week I kind of go to the driving range and um, they, they give you a bucket of balls. You'd have kind of a world class instructor who'd help you on your swing and turns out you actually get college credit for it. So you know, I found that to be pretty unique. But uh, you know, fun fact, we had Tiger Woods go to Stanford as well. He, I think he dropped out in the second or third year like a lot of successful Stanford alums did. Or I shouldn't say the word alums because he dropped out. But uh, anyway, short version is we do have a big sports presence on campus. In terms of student organizations, so um, Kind of a mix of intellectual and non-intellectual so you know we have a quidditch team as well which i'm not really going to opine on but uh, whoever wants to play quidditch i'm not going to judge them for that but uh, so i i was pretty active in the entrepreneurship scene on campus so there's a club called bases it has um it's it's, it's pretty large it's got about 200 members and it's very connected to silicon valley so we um we have funding from a lot of top law firms top venture capital firms a couple of investment firms so um they kind of get first dibs on any startup that comes out of the entrepreneurship club um so, so i was very active there there are a couple of finance clubs as well there's kind of your standard student investment club that every campus has they'll give about 20 kids three hundred thousand dollars and see how much is left at the end of the year so uh, there's a student investment club as well and uh let me let me think uh, there, there are a number of cultural organizations. There are a number of um, there, there, there are a number of academic organizations that are kind of fraternity. So you'll have your business fraternity, you'll have your service fraternity, you'll have your chemistry students fraternity as well. And then when it comes to Greek life, I, I guess we're generally seeing Greek life dwindling in the U.S. overall. Just um, there's a lot more restrictions around you know keeping things um keeping things right but stanford's got a small greek population it's about 10 percent of the student body and it's actually been getting smaller over the years so kind of kind of the opposite of what seems to be going on in chicago but that's certainly an option for people um there are a number of Greek organizations that cater to you know, different groups of people different types of people different backgrounds so if greek life is something you're interested in i'm sure you'll um you, you'll find a home on campus but overall, students tend to be very busy, right? So we're, you know, for, for example, I, I was a double major, but I, would, I made it a point to not be working on problem sets all day, right? I, I, I had eight years at TISB where I was obviously put through the IB, which was an amazing experience, but I feel like college is a little more about opening up, uh, getting to know people, you know, being part of student organizations. I, I, my overall advice to people would be, you can, you know, you can get the 3.9 GPA, but you can also get a 3.5. And you know, unless you want to be a PhD or academic expert in your field, um, there's there's a lot more to life than kind of getting a top tier GPA. You know, college is about meeting people, broadening your horizons, figuring out if you want to get a job or if you want to start your own company. And um, being a sociable person, being a networked person, being um, being someone with broader perspectives is more important than um, you know focusing on GPA. You you had your TIs, VIB careers for that and. That's a very important part of your life, but college is about opening up a little more. Uh, frankly, I mean, for example, I don't use, I get this question a lot, right? I work in investment banking now and I neither use my economics degree nor my computer science degree. That's not to say that you don't need to go to college to get you know, get a job in finance, but um, point being, it's a very social job. It's a very sales oriented job. And I mean, being smart helps. You know, your clients appreciate the fact that you're quantitatively minded and you can, pick up concepts very quickly, but in the real world, you'll find that people emphasize you know, social skills and being able to meet people and work with people 
as much as they emphasize you know, being uh, academically proven. So I think that's some very important advice which we'll definitely keep in mind. So this question is actually a very, very popular one. So how are the dorms and food? How are slash were the dorms and food on each of your campuses, especially as Indian students? This is a very big concern for a lot of people. I, I can kick this one off. So um, dorms are mixed, right? You can um, uh, they, they exist on a spectrum. So I got lucky for two years. I had a single room for my sophomore year. I had a two room double. So kind of two single rooms with the door in the middle and then, then you share a sink and a wardrobe um, and kind of another private space. And then my first year I had a very small, um, what's the term for it? I think it's one room double. So it's a mix. You could be in a fraternity house and have very little personal space or you could be in kind of one of the nicer, you know, more spacious dorms and have a single room. So accommodation is generally very good. Um, one thing you'll find in the US and um, I'm, I'm not sure how India has evolved in that regard, but dorm rooms are fully co-ed, you know, bathrooms and showers are co-ed as well. Um, and th that's that's again something you something you'll get used to and something that's generally an increasing part of uh, American colleges now. In terms of food, again, that's also on a spectrum. I decided to buy a car in my sophomore year. So a lot of times I would just drive off campus and pick up a meal there. I just drive with my friends and get takeout. Um, you know, Indian people will find that food generally lacks flavor, even if it says spicy in front of it, it just completely lacks flavor because we're used to you know, having 20 different spices in our food, right? So um, I'm sure that's something you'll miss. So maybe maybe carry a little bottle of hot sauce or something or, or, or learn how to cook or uh, you can buy a car as well, or you can just you know, use public transport. Might be a good opportunity to get out of the campus and explore some restaurants in the city. But um, campus food is def was definitely kind of hit or miss at Stanford, so uh, I, I avoided it when possible. I mean, I could go next. Um, so dorm rooms, I would second that. It's really different depending on kind of how lucky you get in your first year, but. Um, you have to live on dorm at UC in the dorms in U Chicago for your first two years. So I don't know if that's the same everywhere, but so that means that you're living again with the same hundred group of people for your first two years. So I think that's a positive. Um, in terms of how the rooms are and things, they're pretty great. Um, uh, they provide you a lot of information when you're choosing, so you can actually make a good choice based on that. But in terms of amenities, I mean, I think it's similar to any other private school in the US. It's really good. Um, I think the food is really nice, um, which is surprising, but um, like I, I honestly think they do a decent job with it. It's expensive, but it's nice. Um, I, uh, they have like a buffet and a lot of stuff you can get. As an Indian, I actually had like a different experience compared to other people. So a lot of my friends are again at Berkeley or in, uh, in the West Coast and there's a slightly higher Indian population there. And, you know, I hear some people tell me hey, I was missing Indian food and I on the weekend went and got something from a place close by. But um, in Chicago, it's the Midwest and there are Indians there. Of course, there are Indians everywhere, but I think it's less compared to places like California. So um, I have one Indian place that's within delivery distance of me and another one I found where if I have to get there, I have to do like a 15 minute Uber. So, I mean, it exists, of course, but it's definitely not the variety or uh, really even the quality of like kind of Indian food if you're looking for that, that you could probably get in other cities. But I always look at that as like a positive thing. I mean, I had to break out of that and now I eat a lot of more different things. Um, so that's the food aspect. Was there another part? I'll get, I'll get back to it if I forgot something. No, so, heard, yeah. Um, for dorms, I think everyone needs to know that going into Berkeley, you are guaranteed housing for your first year. And I don't know how that's changing. Like right now, if you're going into Berkeley, um, I think they're giving you single rooms if you're, I think school's online now, so it doesn't really matter. But like for, for my experience, first year, you're guaranteed housing. Second year, you can reapply, but the priority will always be freshmen. They are building new dorms, but that will take another two or three years for them to actually finish construction. So um, 
There are floors that you can actually request that are single gender floors if you feel uncomfortable, which I did request, and I found that my bathroom was way neater than the co-ed ones. I'm not saying that it's a sign, <laughs> but I'm saying that there's definitely something there to that. Um, we actually had a second floor of all guys, and they put a toaster in the dryer and set us out all in the street for like two hours during finals week. So I wouldn't say that. Um, living in dorms is a fun experience and it's a mixed bag. You can get really nice housing, but some of the nicer dorms are a little further from campus. You have to walk a little, but they're huge rooms and you have a lot more space. Or you get like a closer like triple to campus and while it might be closer to some of the flute areas, you don't have, it's not like that big a room, so you can't bring that much stuff and it kind of gets cramped and it's a little frustrating because you have to keep it very clean that if, you, if you're living in those close quarters. But after freshman year, I moved off campus, got my own apartment and here you can do one of two things. You can get a meal plan and continue to eat on campus, which I could not do because I am lactose intolerant and I'm vegetarian, which in the US, like impossible to find food unless you want like boiled vegetables, which I think are awful. So. Um, I learned how to cook, so you can do that, or you can like, there's hundreds of Asian restaurants or, you know, Thai food, Mexican food, um, pretty much any type of food that you, you're craving, Berkeley will have it. It's just a very diverse city, as Aditya was saying, Bay Area is great like that. So I think that it's a, food is always a mixed bag, but um, I remember not eating on in cafeterias in freshman year more often than eating at them. And I think that's like, just because a lot of the food there isn't that great for you, there's not a lot of balanced meals. So if you're pretty conscious about what you're eating, like there's less emphasis on vegetables. And there's a lot more emphasis on just carb. So if you're not into that, I would recommend like figuring out if you can use the communal kitchens or maybe like get, a, get an apartment um, with campus that has like an option for you to cook for yourself. Yeah, I'm going to quickly add, I think some that's, that's a point that um, Gory and Shikhar addressed. So Stanford has kind of guaranteed four years of uh, housing on campus. Uh, we're a little different in that we're not really a city campus, right? Like, you know, UC Berkeley, you can, it's, it's a very urban campus. I go there a couple of times a year to recruit interns who are, um, and we can talk about that later. But um, if, you, if you want to live off campus, you're um, kind of in one of the most expensive real estate areas in the nation. So it's very hard to find housing or affordable housing off campus. So that's one thing that's good about Stanford. Uh, kind of a drawback or just a consideration for people to think about is um, you're kind of in a bubble, right? You're in campus, on campus for all four years. Whereas if you're in say NYU or you know, Berkeley or let me think like UCLA, uh, not UCLA as much, maybe USC, right? Your, your campus kind of bleeds into the city, right? So there's kind of that quasi urban slash campus experience where you know you, you might you might need to learn how to how to experience the city you might need to learn how to cook you might need to kind of furnish your own place right but at Stanford it almost feels like you're in summer camp for four years because you have a dorm fully furnished everything taken care of so it's a very different experience you certainly do feel like you're in a bubble at times given you're in this suburban area where you know everything outside is just venture capital firms and startups right it's very kind of spread out so just a consideration. I know some people love kind of that bubble um, campus experience or other people who wanted something more, uh, something like NYU, right, or LSE or, you know, other schools, fill in the blanks. Just to like add on to that, because I know how important it is, I will say it, it's not impossible to find housing off campus, especially like I think everyone signs leases by the time they turn 18, you have your parents as like, um, what is it called? like co-guarantors and stuff yeah. it is just it is it is it is hard to do because you have to take care of your own place finding like renting on your own like do you even know what the prices are fair are you paying enough how are you going to split rent with your roommates like these are all things that you don't expect to be able to know but we were all thrown in and by like our third year now we're renegotiating some of our contracts with our landlords especially like during covid like knowing knowing what to do in these kinds of situations and having an exposure to it definitely helps just because I, I know I won't be like as unaware or caught off guard when I go into the real world and like now I know things to consider like how close am I to the nearest bus stops how close am I to the BART stations how close am I to the nearest grocery store Berkeley's kind of like a food desert in some ways like some parts of you, some places you can't get food from like a grocery store like there's not food like within a mile radius which means that you need to have a car you need to have like some way of traveling to get to the nearest Trader Joe's or Safeway so like being aware of those things I think now is a lot more important 
to me, just because I have experience like living off campus, I know that if I need to get groceries, how to like schedule my day around that. Or if I need to like, it's my t my week doing the chores for the like for the weekend, I need to plan my day around, oh, I need to vacuum, I need to do, do my dishes, I need to organize, you know, organize the apartment or whatever. Like I got a lot of exposure with that, but on the, like, on the downside, because we're on a very urban campus, um, it can be unsafe and it's it's about as unsafe as like San Francisco or any large city, but there are like extra precautions everybody just needs to take, like being aware of your surroundings and, you know, not having headphones in when you're walking somewhere late at night. So that's like a little bit of a drawback. You're, you're not as protected and you're kind of thrown into a city where I think on my first week there, some, I saw someone get robbed and I think that was my first experience of seeing something like that. So like just being aware of where you are in a city like Berkeley is very important. I mean, uh, just building off of that, I think UChicago has like a combination of the more campus feel that Stanford probably has and because it's smaller and everyone's in like their own bubble. Um, and it's also kind of in a rural area, so it has that. And then also probably has a little bit of the uh, crime rate and things like that that Gauri just mentioned. So you do have to make sure you know where you're going and you need to know your safety protocols. And I guess it helps you grow up in terms of like the apartments and stuff. So I'm still I'm going to be a rising second year, so uh, I think it would be I'm not ready to say I know how it is going to be to move off campus. So I've got my lease and stuff. It's not that hard. Uh, uh, you learn stuff like negotiating the lease and finding people to stay with, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, it's not very hard to do, and it's really, really common in Chicago because um, the area we live in isn't a very high real estate pricey area, so it's easier to get apartments. Um, but yeah, you do have to make sure you know where you're going and you follow your safety protocols and stuff. I'm so jealous of you guys. You have three more, three more years of college. I, you I'm graduating it next year that. during COVID. Like, I don't know what's <laughs> happening with the job market yeah, right now. Fair enough. <laughs> I have a bunch of friends who are going to business school this fall and they've all kind of deferred admission because, right. because of what's going on. Interesting. And I think there's, I mean, you guys all have this great advice since you've been through it. And I really hope um, everyone here is really taking note of this. So maybe moving on to more academic territory, how many hours of lectures and homework um, do you or did you have? Was it manageable? And what are your personal tips on keeping up with academic work? So maybe Aditya, we continue with you and then we move on to Shekhar and Gauri. Yeah, so let me think. Um, I, I guess my academic workload was manageable. I, I frankly, it wasn't advisable. I mean, yes, I kind of got through two bachelor's degrees in four years, but if I were to do college again, I would have probably done a major in just economics or something, and then a couple of minors in something that actually interested me. Not to say I wasn't interested in computer science and economics, but um, my, my point earlier about how little bearing your college major has on what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, right? I uh, there are a couple of people in my office who are history majors. There's a guy who's a you know a mechanical engineering major, and he works in finance, right? So your, your college major isn't as related to what you're going to do in the real world. So just put that in perspective, and I would avoid doing a double major like I did. So uh, that's why I think Gordy and Shikhar might have a kind of a more balanced perspective. Uh, my workload was kind of crazy. I mean, I had I was doing about 25 units every quarter. Um, typical student does about 19 or 20. So uh, like I said earlier, I prioritized academics slightly differently. So my, my goal was to get through these units. My goal was to do respectably well, you know, understand, you know, kind of the 85% of the material as opposed to kind of trying to maximize 100%, which is what, what we do at TISB. But um, the good part about Stanford is we have a lot of online lectures. So, you know, if I had a computer science or economics lecture clashing, given that they weren't coordinated dual degree programs between two departments. I mean, I was essentially independently doing my two majors with different departments and there wasn't really much support from either in terms of managing clashing schedules. It was very easy with the engineering school. Everything's recorded. Um, you, you can always watch the lectures at two or three times speed and it's very easy to get used to it uh, soon enough. I'm sure Gauri and Sugar can tell you about that, <laughs> but uh, it's something you'll get used to a lot. Um, let me think, Gen decent amount of flexibility in terms of scheduling afternoon classes versus morning. I'm a morning person now, but I was not much of a morning person then, so I would have a lot of my classes after 11 a.m. 
because I'd frequently be working on problem sets till about you know, 3 or 4 a.m. On, on most days. So I had the flexibility of kind of starting my day a little bit later, and then I could catch up on my computer science lectures over video. And keep in mind, this is just a lecturer or professor teaching 100 students, right? We have section afterwards, which is where, frankly, you can do a lot of your learning. And uh, I think that can be addressed in another question. But for computer science, at least, you know, lecture sizes are maybe 100 people, you know, eight, kind of 80 to 150, right? And then section would be an intimate group of maybe 10 students led by a grad student or, or undergrad student in some cases. And that's where a lot of learning really takes place. Um, I, I actually, I, so I, I acted as a section leader for CS106, which was a tremendous experience. So if anyone, you know, uh, likes teaching, you should 100% Look for opportunities where you can be a teaching assistant or a section leader. Definitely a great way to understand the material. Um, a kind of a good way to give back as well. Uh, you know, teach kind of younger students as well. On the economics side, you know, lectures were much smaller. So, you know, I, I was in classes with no section and it was just 10 people and a professor. Um, I, I took a class called Economics of Ancient Greece, which was very interesting because I wanted to do something different from just you know, demand and supply curves and learn something, some, something new. And it was just the professor and six students. So that, that, that was a very, um, I think something happened to my lighting, but that, that was a good experience as well. Um, so yeah, yeah, so short, short version is economics tended to have smaller lecture sizes. Computer science is one of the most popular majors on campus, so you'd have you know, up to 100 people, but section would be a great way to um, double click on anything you, you didn't cover in lecture. And uh, we, we talked about this earlier. People are generally very collaborative. One thing that's unique about Stanford is we don't we don't have proctors in our exams. So you so you go in the exam room. Your professor comes in. He drops a bunch of question papers up front. Drops a bunch of answer sheets and says, you know, I'm going to leave now. And once you're done, just drop your solutions in the box outside. But he doesn't come and check in on everyone. And and they just trust you to not cheat. And and in my four years at Stanford, I've never seen anyone cheat. Um, you, you wouldn't even have a TA lurking around or uh, coming in to check on people. Once they drop in, drop off the question papers, they leave. And, um, and that, that's kind of how successful the honor system has been, which is why they trust people to collaborate, right? Because they realize, hey, this isn't a competitive environment. We're not, you know, putting some of the smartest people from their, their respective schools in one place and then forcing them to compete again. You have a bunch of um, smart minds in one place and it's important for them to, you know, to learn from, from each other as opposed to compete with each other. And to that end, I mean, Stanford does have a bit of a great inflation policy. So typically the median score on most exams is a B plus, uh, which I'm sure, you know, the Berkeley students are gonna give me uh, give me some dirt for it because they, 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 they have kind of a normal grading curve. I know you Chicago might have a normal grading curve. I know Princeton tends to practice a great deflation. So if you get the median, you, you probably end up with a C. But a short version is if you, if you do a decent number of the questions and do somewhat OK, you will get a B plus at Stanford. So um, the, ch the classes are very challenging, but there's less pressure based on the collaborative culture and um, kind of the great inflation system. So pros and cons, really. Right. Um, yeah, so looking at U Chicago and looking at like the academics, I, there are multiple things I talk about. I'll start off by talking about the quarter system. So um, I don't know how much our listeners know about this, but there are two big systems used in the US, the semester system and the quarter system. The quarter system is just faster. You have fewer weeks to do a lot more content compared to other schools, so we do that. Um, that means that your classes are quite fast paced so you get a lot of content at you. Um, but I think it's probably the natural progression for after IB if you want to I think IB prepares you well for that. So I don't think it's something that really hits you too much, but um, it is the natural progression and you do have to work hard to stay on top of things. I completely agree with Aditya in the sense that my goal in college isn't to try and stay in the library for as long as I can, though I completely understand why people do want that and you can do whatever you want. But for me, I'm really, really active in a lot of like college, we call it RSOs or clubs which um, I'm a part of. So a lot of my time goes into that. And that means that I try and pick my classes so I don't stay in the library all the time, but sometimes it does come to that. And I don't think that's really a big difference from TISB. Something that's really different about the academics at UChicago is something we call the core. So 
there are like eight different aspects, eight different subject areas that all you Chicago undergrads have to take courses on before you graduate. So I have to do a two quarter humanity sequence where I learn about something like the language and the human or readings of world lit, basically like a humanities course. Then I have to do a civilization sequence where I, I mean, I'm planning to do it abroad, but you learn about a civilization and you have to do that. You do have to do a social science sequence. You have to do a biology, bio sequence, a physics sequence. So there are like a lot of like requirements that you have to do. Uh, that's kind of special to you, Chicago. Um, for me, it's been amazing. I feel like I've got to learn a lot of things that otherwise I probably wouldn't have bothered learning about. And it's helped me shut things that I definitely now know I'm not interested in. So that itself is like a big thing. And so that's something that's different. And really the fact that every U Chicago student does it means that whoever you meet, you do have some common ground. And I feel that that can help when you're trying to make friendships and stuff that you have gone through quite a similar experience as all the 7,000 students who are part of the school. Um, so again, the rigor depends on a couple of things. It depends on which major you take uh, and it depends on which level you take that major at. So um, I'm probably going to do a single major right now, an economics major, and I'll probably do a minor in uh, data science and this other Russian thing, which I'm not quite sure about. But essentially, uh, it, there are different levels you can do a subject at. You can do it at like an honors level. You can do it like a standard level. Then you have like various business tracks for someone like who is an athlete who needs to try and get through. But so you should really look at it based on how you want to do it. I think there's enough flexibility to identify a path that suits what you're doing. Um, and the fourth thing I'm going to talk about is class size. So I've actually been really impressed by how small class sizes can be at UChicago. Even for introductory courses, I was the biggest class I've been in is a class with 40 students. And I think that's not an experience other people have had. So um, we have 600. So. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, other than like a micro econ class where I think we have 200 people, but other than that, all of my classes have been maybe 50 people maximum. And that does give you a lot of more time to talk to a professor. It also makes you feel a lot more like you were at TISV in the sense that you have the same teacher and if they're teaching you across multiple quarters, it becomes like kind of like a TISV has 25, 30 students in your class kind of experience. And that helps you and you get to know your professors really well. And I think that helps when you get recommendations and things that you actually have had a lot of experience meeting them. Also class sizes tend to decrease as you go into your major. So in introductory classes, maybe slightly bigger, but when you're really doing your specialized classes, you know that you're gonna have a very small teacher to student ratio. And the small class sizes, uh, the trade off with that is that sometimes it's much harder to get into a class at U Chicago than it may be at another school. I'm not quite sure about other schools, but I know that a lot of my time goes into trying thinking about how I bid for my classes and there's a whole process to that. But uh, you oftentimes don't get the class you want to, especially in your first year, or maybe in your first two years. So you need to be slightly more flexible and say you want to do the biological sequence class right now, but you don't get in, then you can do a different part of the core and come back to it. So that's a reality of having small classes. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is grade deflation. So um, our school definitely historically practiced a lot of grade deflation and that like has now I think it decreased a bit. People still will always complain about it, but I think it's relatively fair. I think our classes are largely curved to a B, uh, sometimes a B minus. It depends on the professor. Um, so I guess the positive about that is an A really means a lot. Uh, and so you can look at it that way. But yeah, there is definite grade deflation or just a normal grade, not no inflation for sure. Okay, so if you're looking for small class sizes, intro CS classes at Berkeley are 2,000 students. So no one is actually expected to go to lecture, a lot of lectures online, and the place where a lot of learning actually happens, like Aditya was saying, is like section, labs, and like discussions where you are you have like a lot smaller and more personal relations with like the person teaching you. But I, I will say that 
I think a very underutilized resource is actually going to office hours where a professor yeah. or like a section leader or anyone like a GSI, which is a grad student instructor, actually sets aside four plus hours or so a week where you can go, you can pop in, ask them questions about the course, ask them questions about their life. Like I think now because um, Berkeley is all online, I've been able to actually set up Zoom meetings with professors I haven't had classes with before. And I think that that's such an underutilized resource because I, don't, I think college, especially for the first year or so, I really should have used it, but I was too afraid because I was like, what if no one else is there? And like, what if I seem like this really annoying kid and my the professor doesn't like me, but my two closest like professors um, are these two econ professors that I attended like almost all their office hours. And like, we have, a, we have had amazing discussions and they're providing me with my refer like re references and recommendations just because they know me really well and they've seen me in class and they've seen how I perform. So I think that people get very daunted by large classes and I'm definitely one of those people where I see a 1,700 people class and I get very intimidated. But I think there is a lot of ways around that in that you can attend, you can't, you don't have to attend lecture, you can watch lecture at home and then you can go to section and like learn the material there and you can go to labs which are much smaller, 20 people maximum and everyone gets space in a lab. So it's not like you're fighting for seats for that. But um, I will also talk about like teaching. I also teach like intro CS courses, but I don't teach like um, intro Python or anything. I teach um, intro CS to people who've never taken CS in their lives. And it's actually a lot of people. So I think our class last fall was like 600 or so people for people. And this course is a class that if you've never taken CS before and you're intimidated by programming, it's kind of for you to ease into the Berkeley CS major and it's called CS 10 and it's a really large program. So I got I get to like tutor and they do pay you. So if you like want to pursue these things just for like if you want to like supplement your, you know, your parents sending you money and you want to like make money for yourself, you can definitely work and like take up campus jobs for to make money. And it's like not that intensive time commitment. You do have to take some courses to like get trained, but I really agree with Avivia and that teaching intro CS and helping give back to the community is it's quite rewarding just because I know how I felt walking into that class like two years ago and I know how people feel now when they walk into that class and I want to put them at ease that they're in good hands and that this course is there to support them and me like helping reassure them with that like I think that class has actually given me some of my best memories on campus. So if you're able, if you're ever able to like have an opportunity to teach someone or teach something at, at the university you attend, giving back is probably the best way that you can contribute. And I'm not talking financial alumni donations after you graduate. So um, I think giving back is really great. And I also think that Berkeley is pretty flexible and we do have like a similar core requirements. We have breath classes and one of my favorite classes that I've ever taken is like my anthropology class in freshman year. It was the most random. My professor was like a biker dude, showed up in a motorcycle. He was completely amazing and, and he opened my eyes to basically the entire world of biological anthropology. So you get to take really random crazy classes that you never thought you'd be able to take with these professors that are PhD or, or more and really should be doing like an archaeological dig somewhere else, but they just want to teach for fun. So like because you're able to like interact with professors that are just that different from like the major that I'm pursuing, it really opens your mind to what the world is really like. So I think that's also a really great part about like your schedule. Everyone takes breath classes, but there is a lot of great deflation. I think for a lot of the engineering schools, like my friend is a material science engineer major and her like the average class grades are C's and C pluses and those get curved to A's. But if you're in here thinking like I need to get like 100 percent in your exam exam, it's possible, but no one does it. There's a reason it's they're very hard examinations. You are thrown into classes where professors tend to presume that you have a higher understanding than you actually do. And especially if you don't come in with very strong fundamentals, you might feel a little thrown off. So I think that if you go in with the expectation that I'm going to come out of this with like straight 4.0 GPA. Don't kid yourself. These there's a reason why a lot of people don't graduate from these schools with like that amazing GPAs. A lot of your college experience is more than that. It's like building the connections and networking and like analyzing problems and thinking outside the box. That's what college is really for. So if you're thinking that I'm going to graduate with a 4.0 for my resume, like please do not kid yourself because the kind of sacrifices you would be making if you're if you want that that's fine but i'm just saying that don't walk in with the expectation that that will happen because a lot of people especially at berkeley tend to get hit with this realization after their 
fall semester and it makes them question why they're at the school. It's not that the school is not the right place for you. It's just that you need to readjust your expectations and that expecting a 4.0 as soon as you graduate, as soon as you come in is going to be very challenging unless you take and balance your course load. I think that people I know have taken four technical classes and expected everything to go OK. But if you're taking four upper division material science engineering and mechanical engineering classes, like you're you're not going to have a fun semester. Every every engineering class is approximately like I think every day expected hours of work is like at least four hours of work for each yeah. class. And I don't know if you agree with that, but engineering classes, especially course load is insane. Do not go in every semester, plan out your semesters. I cannot emphasize this enough. Take breaks. And I know some people like you might have pressures from outside, like please remember that you are a student too. And it's very important that you're taking classes that help you show the best version of yourself. And even if that means you're going to take like, I'm taking elementary Telugu next fall just because I never learned to read and write and I felt really bad about it for a lot of my life but also because I'm taking like a pretty intense course load and I don't want to stress myself out in my senior year so like am I ashamed that I'm taking a class like that at Berkeley like no because I need to balance my schedule and I know how important it is to make sure that I get like a full and more broader perspective so I think that you can definitely make your schedule work for you it's not about how many hours you put in it's about how you plan your time and how you spend your time Definitely agree, and I, I spend a lot of time recruiting, and, and in particular from University of California, Berkeley, actually, and I've never rejected someone because their GPA wasn't high enough. So I, I see a 3.2 or 3.3 GPA from Berkeley. That's very, very respectable because uh, you know, I know they're above average. They're you know, they had ahead of the curve, and and they had a life outside of just kind of spending time in the library. So just. Um, get this whole thing in perspective. I mean, TISB is a phenomenal school in terms of preparing people for success in the IB. And you will find that life gets easier, you know, when, when you've done the IB. But you'll also find that that 4,000 word extended essay that you thought was the hardest thing in the world is is, is a joke in college. It's um, You'll be writing 10,000 word essays every week, twice as long as your extended essay. And that's not scary at all. You'll be doing that with ease once you get used to college. But you also realize that you know, you're not going to be getting get, getting a 45 of the IB is different from getting a 4.0 from a top university. It's not not the same thing and it's not necessarily worth it unless you're kind of shooting for an academia type of role, in which case you're probably, you know, smart enough to get that GPA anyway because you're naturally smart and you can, you can absorb all the material by just listening to it for the first time in lecture. But you know, definitely just avoid burnout, focus on learning. Now, it may come across as a cliche, but I'm, uh, I cannot stress this enough. Focus on learning. Focus on a balanced course load. So I was double majoring in CS and Econ, but I took a couple of music courses. I took took intro to opera, where we analyzed opera like you would analyze Shakespeare and IB English. And we went to the SF opera a couple of times, and it was a lot different from just writing computer programs all day or drawing demand and supply curves. As, as I guess my takeaways are, I mean, just focus on learning. Uh, don't think about GPA as much. Just focused on having a respectable GPA and something that you're comfortable with. And realize that college isn't the same as high school. You know, there's a lot more to life than just you know, getting straight A's. Actually, like real quick, um, when Aditya was talking about burnout, Berkeley is 16 weeks. It is a mm -hmm. full semester. And the difference between a quarter and a semester is a quarter is a sprint. And that's a challenge. And a semester is a marathon because after you have like a spring break for um, spring semester and you have Thanksgiving break for fall, like a lot of people tend to like take it back or kick back and take it easy before finals week because we have one week where we don't have any classes. It's like kind of like your R&R &R week where you're supposed to be revising, but people use that week completely misuse it, you know, don't spend a lot of time studying or revising and then it kind of like it's all crammed in the last minute. But that's just because by the time you hit that 15th week, it's just been so much you want to take a break. So I think burnout is quite serious and I, I don't think people talk about it enough. But if you're going to do like whether a sprint or a marathon, you know, 16 weeks or 12 weeks, make sure you don't tire yourself out mentally because once you're at that point where you can't study anymore, nothing's going to go in. And trust me, we I think everyone in their college career at some point has been there when they realize that I'm not learning anything tonight. I just need to sleep and, you know, get over this. You need to remember that like balancing your schedule and like lowering your expectations is perfectly all right. And it might, everyone's path might work for them, but it doesn't have to work for you. 
So that's some amazing advice we'll definitely remember as we go into college. So like a lot of people also want to do internships or research while they're in college. So at your respective colleges, how do you find internships and research opportunities in the areas you're interested in? I can start off with that since I've kind of went through the internship route and then got a full time job using that internship. So one thing that's very, very underestimated is reaching out to alumni. Um, I get I get a ton of emails on LinkedIn asking me, hey, how do I get into investment banking? Can I uh, how do I position myself for an internship? But just frankly, I get so many emails that if I see someone from Stanford, I'm just more likely to respond. Right. And it's just I'm more it's more relatable. I can I feel like I want to help them out a little more. Not that I don't want to help everyone else out, but um, anecdotally, I can tell you that if you email an alum, they're very likely to respond to you. And that's a channel that a lot of people don't uh, don't utilize as much. So you know, definitely register for that alumni association account. And um, there should be some sort of tool that will enable you to sort alumni by department, by field of study, by, you know, job title right now by how old they are and when they graduated so that's a great source of internships your freshman year because a lot of internships are designed for juniors because you do your internship between your third year and fourth year once you're a senior you come back as a full-time employee after graduation and uh, that's kind of the internship i did so um alumni is great um cold email emailing is also very important i mean just get a bunch of email addresses and shoot them the same generic email make sure to change the name of the company Make sure to get their name right. And I, I get I get emails sometimes saying, "Hey, I'm very interested in applying to J.P. Morgan." And I'm like, "I don't work for J.P. Morgan." So <laughs> uh, I appreciate the effort, but I have 20 emails I got the name of my firm right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on them. So you know, build that kind of template email, but send them out to 50 people. I know someone who emailed 300 people and got one internship from it in his freshman year. So don't be afraid to be persistent. The worst thing that can um, that people can say to you is, "No, I'm sorry," or or they might just not respond to you. But even if they say, no, I'm sorry, they're not thinking about you because they've moved on and they're doing other things. So don't be shy, you know, reach out to people, reach out to alums, ask for jobs. That's how you get jobs. You don't get jobs by submitting your resume online and hoping they will invite you to an interview. You get a job because you ask someone for it. Uh, the other thing I can't stress enough is networking events. So definitely go to these networking sessions. I've Many times I've given interviews to people with a three five versus a three nine stellar resume because the you know the person came up and talked to me at the information session and I developed a legitimate connection with them. In the real world, you're working with other human beings. You're not working with resumes and GPAs and transcripts. So you know come across as a legitimately curious individual who is talented, who's got a string of experiences behind them, but is also a person. They have interests, they have you know goals, they have hobbies, they have you know their quirks, they have their weird aspects about them. And don't be afraid to kind of let those things come out in an interview. Um, I, I, guess, I guess to summarize, I've kind of been rambling for a bit is you know the main channels for getting an internship before your third year is alumni, networking and cold emails and LinkedIn's a great tool for that. For your third year internship, there's typically a structured process by which you can apply for that penultimate year job. Uh, there, there, there will be a finance club, there will be a consulting club that will prepare you for these kind of roles. If it's an engineering job and you're at an engineering school, uh, you'll be getting a ton of inbounds anyway, so it should be very easy to score interviews. And then um, for your third year interview, try to utilize them as a way to get a full time offer. Nothing is uh, nothing's more amazing than starting your fourth year of college knowing that you have a full time job waiting for you when you graduate. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. So um, again, so I'm a rising second year, so I'm just getting used to the internship stuff. But um, from what I can tell and what we've been told that U Chicago, the internship structure is really good. Um, some of the special aspects are stuff like we have this really big program called the Metcalf program where like U Chicago funds a lot of internships. So uh, oftentimes when I'm a first year, it's tough for me to convince a company to, you know, sponsor me and pay me whatever money to do an internship. But what the Metpra Metcalf program allows me to do is I uh, met this guy at the entrepreneurship center. He had a startup and he was like, I was like, can I work with you? And he's like, yeah, sure. But X, Y, Z, Corona crisis, et cetera. But I just contacted U Chicago's Metcalf program and they gave me a stipend to go and work for him. And that was really amazing because uh, 
it really helps you get those internships even if the opportunity doesn't even really exist. Um, then in terms of resources I'm using, uh, a lot of it for me has come through alumni who've gone to the clubs that I've attended. So I don't know how it works in different universities, but for U Chicago, there are like a uh, select few uh, consulting and finance clubs that tend to be uh, actually quite selective in their application process itself. So uh, I feel like I've faced less rejection in getting internships and more rejection in getting into the clubs on campus. So, and it's it actually been a good experience. I'm doing like actual interviews and behaviorals and technicals when like I'm a first year and there are pros and cons, of course, uh, but so a lot of networking happens through our clubs. Um, but in terms of just job opportunities in general, U Chicago is getting a lot more business oriented than it used to be. It's a research university, but now we have a career advancement team. And from what I can tell, just from Handshake, which is the portal we have to get jobs, there are a lot of things available. And from like upperclassmen friends who are getting jobs, like I feel like it's a good place to be to get those jobs. Um, it's definitely getting a lot more businessy though, and that's good. Now coming to research, I mean, that's U Chicago's strong point. So it's a research university. It devotes a lot of its time to research. I think there's a stat that always goes around that we have more research positions open than undergraduates who want to do research. So um, from my experience, it's been really, really um, easy to get a research internship. It's almost been easier than not to. I, I mean, in the sense that if you ever get to know a professor, he'll probably just have something going on and ask you to come on board. So uh, it's probably slightly harder in economics. So U Chicago has, I think 50% of students at U Chicago have an e economics major. So it's slightly harder there, but it's still really doable. And if really research is what you want to do, um, U Chicago is pretty much perfect for that. We have a lot of opportunities for people and um, it's been quite easy, at least for now. Research is really easy to get just because I know freshmen who are researching at like the, I don't know if you've heard of like the LBNL laboratories. So especially for like science majors, like physics, um, CS, chem, bio, like anything, anything science or STEM, there's a lot of research opportunities. And I think econ has some pretty solid research too, but they don't really tend to take like freshmen. But I know that one of my friends is a freshman and she works in like with the radiology department up in the Lawrence Berkeley labs. And because we're, we have a lot of like close ties with a lot of laboratories in and around the area, um, like I think that that's just helped because you can apply through Europe, which is this undergrad research application, and um, you can apply into like programs that you're interested in and put your put them in order of your preferences. And then professors that have open slots can take you. They can either interview you or accept you right away. So like I have loads of friends that have done econ research since freshman year. I have friends that have been working on like um, physics projects from freshman in freshman year and have worked on it all the way till now and will continue to work on it as they graduate. So those are people who want to do academia. So a lot of people who tend to want to do research go into pursuing a master's straight after school and go into like the PhD and doctoral route. Um, internships, I think because we're in the Bay Area, like I think that's a great thing for both Stanford and Berkeley. You have tons of startups and you have tons of opportunities and places that you could work. So it's not hard to get an internship. I've actually found a lot of internships just by applying online. So you can definitely go that route too. Um, but I would agree that you can reach out to people and networking events are very important because making connections versus like them just seeing your application makes quite a big difference because what you come off on as paper on paper versus just coming up how you come off in person is very different. So there are loads of consulting clubs that like manage pretty big, pretty big funds and there's lots of finance clubs and business clubs. So if you ever want to join one of those, I, I agree with Shikhar, <laughs> you get a lot more rejections from those than you do for uh, with the average internship. I don't know what it is with them, but they are very hard. Some of them are more competitive than like, like they have a 3% acceptance rate. Three or four rate. application rounds. You'll have like a first round interview, a second round interview, yeah, case and study, have like case studies. social, and then they'll decide, mm -hmm. they'll, they'll pick maybe five, 15 people out of 300 applicants. It's kind yeah, of crazy. I think I know one of these clubs that didn't say how many spots they had opened, but they only took three students out of, I think, 250 or 270 people applying in. So 
that's like another thing. You can, you can't apply into everything expecting to get in just because you never know how many people they're actually looking for. And a lot of times the processes are very intensive and clubs can take up a lot of your time. So make sure that you're like time managing properly. But I would say that like getting internships is not hard, especially like adding like any of any of our schools are pretty prestigious. So adding any of them onto an application kind of gets you a foot in the door already. Yeah. And if you're able to have like a good interview, like that that makes you an interesting candidate automatically. So I think like a lot of places just tend to see that you're a Berkeley student or you go to Chicago or Stanford and it's automatically a foot in the door, which is such a great like added name brand value. Um, so I can definitely say that that's been really great just because having like the name Berkeley and like some of the professors I've like taken classes under are pretty well renowned. So that's just a, a bit like the benefit of going to a really top school. And I will say that like they don't discriminate. I mean, internships, are very fickle in that if you're a freshman and sophomore, they might not actually have work that they want to give you just because they know that you're not going to come back and work for them. But I had a friend who is an EECS major, which is electrical engineering and computer science. And he did an internship in sophomore year with Google and they liked him so much that he finished his like um, final year in his third year and then graduated and he now works at Google just because they liked him so much. So you can definitely get internships at good companies in your sophomore year, but um, if they have to make cuts to their program, they will cut the sophomores first because the company I'm working at is like a huge Fortune 500 company, but they still were like, we don't know how post COVID, we don't know what our financials will look like. So we're going to cut our sophomores. So they do give precedence to being a junior because they want to be able to give you a final offer after you um, graduate. And one thing I do want to talk about that we didn't really talk about is studying abroad. Um, for my between my sec sophomore year and my junior year, I did I studied abroad in London School of Economics, and I think all our schools offer some really fantastic study abroad options where you can take courses and get credit with your university. And I took econometrics abroad, and I took um, the political economics of public policy, and I think that's also really great. Like, something else that you can do over summer that's not just like academia. It's um, getting an additional perspective and traveling the world and meeting different professors. And I think that some of the like people I've met in those classes are a lot closer to me than some of my friends have actually made at Berkeley just because I've had like different exposure, different meeting, different experience. So I would say that like if you don't want to, you know, work during summer and you want to do something fun and you want to learn as well and get credits with college, you can definitely do a study abroad just in your either your freshman summer or your sophomore summer. But I would recommend for junior summer if you want to work after college like do an internship because that's the only way you're going to get a job. Great, and I think there's, I mean, you guys all mentioned really tangible advice, networking, joining, I mean, trying to join those professional clubs and things like that. So um, maybe let's move on to the questions, um, the audience questions, because we do have a few of those. Um, so quite a popular one is, what were some of your extracurriculars in DISB? Um, I just, you guys probably need to take a couple of moments to think back, but I, I just gathered. We're not that old, but I do. I mean, I didn't know. I don't know. Well, it's been about 10 years for me, so I'm, uh, I'm going to go last. <laughs> look back. So, I mean, uh, what my extracurricular the TIs be? So, um, I was part of the badminton team. That took a bit of my time. Uh, other than that, I was at the end part of the prefect body and uh, so organizing Vivum and stuff was a big part of my um, high school, especially during like senior year and stuff where literally my entire summer in 12th grade was organizing Vivum and it was so much fun. But uh, so a lot of my time went into prefect related stuff as head boy. And then um, other than that, we used to organize this business fest called Savage, which we used to help out with, I think, Miss Sandhya. Uh, forced us into that so we used to do a lot of that and um, other than that outside school there was a lot more like startup stuff that I used to take part in um, uh, like I started this kind of small company that used to make uh, that used to sell um, kind of art paintings that are not used anymore anywhere after they're made in like a school or used for an examination online so a lot of my time went into that but I think you should just keep doing something that you're interested in. Uh, and then when you get to your college application, you can try and create a story around how that makes you someone who would really, if you can do this with, if you can do something big with 
the resources in your high school. Uh, imagine what I could do with the resources of a Stanford or a Berkeley. So uh, that's how I went about it. Um, and yeah, that's what I did in TIV. Okay, I think I was really into music, so I don't know. I mean, I don't think this is an option anymore, but we were, um, we weren't really allowed to like do music after 11th and 12th because you know IB course load kicks in and stuff. So Mr. James started the music as an internal diploma, I think, for our for our year. So we did that for two years, and we had such fun with that. It was a lot of music, and I was really into singing, so I did a lot of music just in school. Um, and I did music outside school. I think um, I was into sports, but I don't think I was really on any of the teams. So I did have like some, you know, 100 meters, 200 meters, and, like that kind of track and field stuff. So I'm all rep, like an all rounder, or, like well rounded and uh, from an application perspective. But I will say one thing that I did spend a lot of time on was Vivum because I was food HOD. And if anyone knows anything about Vivum, food is the most important part. If you get food wrong for 4,000 people, it is insane. And for some reason for my year, they made two vegetarian people HOD of food. So we had to kind of hypothesize what it would look like if not vegetarians were eating from the places that we were ordering food from. So I think Vivum is actually a fantastic experience to talk about just because it gives it shows that you're capable of managing your time, but also like organizing these massive events. And I like had to negotiate contracts with Krispy Kreme and they were probably the hardest people to talk to just because they were giving me attitude. They were like, we're a foreign company, like we're an MNC. We don't have to take anything from like small students. So like just getting that experience of cold calling people and communicating with these massive yes, companies fun. that don't have time for you. I think that was really great. So I think Vibum was like a big part of my stuff, but also I did stuff outside school. I did a lot of volunteering and I did a lot of teaching on my own time. And I think that made like, because I had a select few passions that I really pursued and really followed, um, I think Berkeley got to see me more as like, oh, she's into a lot of things, but she really loves to like write and she loves to do music and she's been, you know, performing and stuff in school and also outside school. So there's definitely like a continued passion and interest there. So I think that I agree with Sugar and that you can do a lot of things, but as long as you focus on the things that you're really interested in and that you can show you have vested interest and passion about, you're able to make yourself appear as like a better student or a better, um, as like a better, what are they called? People who apply in. I forgot the word. It's it's one o'clock where I am. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is very late. Um. Um. Aditya, did you manage to remember? Uh, e. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of coming back to me. So. Uh, I was involved in a few different things. Um, firstly, music. So music is very important for me. I was uh, I was a classical pianist, so I, I think I, I played in the orchestra. I um, participated in a few competitions. Um, I, I don't know if people still do the Trinity exams. So I, you know, I, was, I was very active in those. Um, kind of went all the way up to grade eight and had a lot of help from the school from that. So um, still, still kind of you know, very thankful for all the help I got from the music teachers. Um, what else? I was on the basketball team, I was on the tennis team. Um, I was teaching piano on the side as well, I remember. The, 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 this was for one summer. And I'd also um, co-founded an NGO with a few know, fellow students as well. So we donated a bunch of computers and, and built these libraries and slums around Bangalore. We part, partnered with World Vision. So once we set up the, you know, the tech infrastructure, set up the libraries, we would uh, we, we would teach them kind of basic Microsoft Office and HTML and you know, programming skills. And uh, I, think that, I think those were the main ones, yeah. So that was quite interesting to hear. So maybe Aditya, you can take this one as well. So what are the job opportunities after college when a person has done an economics and computer science double major? Uh, this is a good question, and you know, whenever I interview people, you know, for the last five minutes, you're like, "Hey, do you have any questions for me?" This is the first question that comes up. Uh, you know, you went to Stanford, you're in Silicon Valley, you studied in computer science. Why are you, uh, why are you working in investment banking, or why, why aren't you not doing one of these six different things? So, uh, I guess let me walk through these quote unquote six different things. So, as as kind of an engineering and economics major, you can 
first off, work as an engineer, right? You can work as a software developer at Google, Facebook, Microsoft, or you could work as a developer at a startup, which uh, frankly, you know, based on my interactions with people in the industry, I would recommend a lot more. If you're at Google, you're just one of 10,000 engineers that are on campus and you're, you don't really get to build anything interesting. But at a startup, you can be one of the first 20 or 30 employees and one or two years out of college, you could be running the entire engineering team, which is what my roommate ended up doing once we graduated. So you can be a developer. If you want to kind of move on more to the economics and business side, you can be a product manager. So you're still kind of very technical, right? You're working on certain features. You're working on, for example, you're working at Google Maps, right? You want to start integrating the satellite feature from Google Earth. Your job is to coordinate five different engineers and figure out what the six or seven milestones are to achieving this feature, setting up the deadline, setting up the product specs and making sure engineers get the work done. So that that's um, product management is kind of going from engineering a little bit, you know, more managerial, right? Um, one other thing you can do is consulting. So strategy consulting for tech companies. Um, Facebook wants to enter the VR market. How big is the market? Should they enter the market organically by building their own product or should they acquire someone else? And uh, another job you can do with kind of a combined economics or computer science degrees, tech investment banking. So um, that's frankly, as I said earlier, not neither economics nor engineering, but my clients are all tech companies, right? So um, I've worked in a few deals. You know, Kareem was is Uber's largest competitor in the Middle East. They got acquired by Uber a year ago. So um, I worked in a team of three people that represented Kareem, negotiated a sale price of about $3 billion to Uber. So if you're kind of interested in working on big ticket transactions, negotiating deals, kind of thinking about the strategic landscape of the tech industry, thinking about numbers, thinking about kind of the quantitative underpinnings of why Uber should pay $1 billion more than the original offer price and creating an economic justification for it, uh, investment banking is really cool. Because um, some of my clients are very high tech, so there's security software companies, they're enterprise software companies, and being a computer science major can help you understand what they do and therefore help you communicate why they're awesome to a prospective buyer. Um, so I had thought about the first three options as well, but I, I kind of wanted a fast paced work environment. I, I ultimately wanted to be a salesman, so I'm, I'm, I'm a tech guy kind of at heart, right? But my job is really to sell tech companies to other tech companies. And uh, that's what kind of got me into the investment banking field. And uh, finally, of course, if you're in economics and computer science or kind of a business and engineering major, you, you can always just start your own company. Um, you know, that's all my Stanford essays were about starting my own company, which is why I wanted to double major in engineering and economics, but realized very early on that I was risk averse and, and you know, didn't really want to start my business going out of college. But frankly, that's something I want to do at some point in the future. So one thing I'd advise a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs is don't don't just start a company for the sake of it. I, I know a lot of people who just wanted to be entrepreneurs because they wanted to be CEO of their own startup, but they didn't really think about what they wanted to build. If you're building a startup, and I mean, I've got I've got a few friends who've been very successful, you know, a couple of them have raised upwards of 20, 30 million dollars. They're genuinely very, very passionate about what they're building. And they believe that this company that I'm building is something that I cannot rest until the world has its product. And if you once you figure out what that thing is, what that vision you have, then you can kind of dedicate all your life to it. But building a startup just for the sake of building a startup is something I wouldn't wouldn't advise people to do out of college. You know, maybe get a job, maybe get some more perspective. Keep in mind that the Mark Zuckerbergs and Bill Gates that you hear about are only the Mark Zuckerbergs and Bill Gates, right? A lot of successful entrepreneurs did work in industry for 15, 20 years and then started a company. So, um, and by the way, engineering and economics is very interesting because then you're, um, you kind of think about the technical aspect and you think about the non-technical aspect. And, and there are many ways you can bring them together, whether it's product management or whether it's consulting or whether it's investment banking. I want to add to that actually. So um, I'm like working as a finance analyst on like the gross profit and pricing team for an industrial supply company. And one thing that they actually really love is to see um, people who are into econ with coding experience or like interested yeah. in coding. So I'm like learning R right now along with my like my company's helping me learn R and I like have experience in Python and SQL and like Teradata and stuff like that. So they like if you don't really want to go the investment route, which is like a great route, Definitely, and I know that like I want to end up there somewhat, like 
at some point in my life. But um, if you're just starting out and you want to get like the lays of the land, corporate finance is also a really interesting thing for you to look at just because I never realized like this is the like the Amazon of like industrial supply. So it's like a very narrow field, but it has a lot of like roles and it's a very large company. And I never really got the scope of how big it was until I started working in their departments. And then I realized that like, wow, I'm actually like contributing so much in terms of like analysis and thought process and helping like write up inflation rates and price, um, you know, price changes. So one of my intern projects was creating a pricing model for um, uh, to study the benefits and effects of psychological pricing on consumers um, buying things on that um, from that firm. So I think that like as an econ major, I got the perspective of like, okay, how do I look at econ research papers? How do I apply and, and create new pricing models? And how do I apply like behavioral econ into this context? And then how do I like build a program out of it? How do I make this applicable in the company and corporate context? So I think that you could also totally do corporate finance and, you know, there's a lot of roles available for that in the Bay Area or around the US. Yeah, I think that's a very helpful response, by the way, because corporate finance is a lot more intrinsic. You're inside a company, you're thinking about ways you can maximize value. So for people who, um, you know, want a more intellectual role, I would actually encourage something like corporate finance or product or engineering over investment banking. And investment banking, frankly, isn't a very intellectual job. It's ultimately a sales job. And if you if you like sleep, um, you should um, probably think about other more balanced options. You know, I, I love what I do, but I generally sleep about, you know, four to five hours a night, even kind of five years out of college. So um, th that's kind of the downside of working in investment banking. Um, the other end of the spectrum is you can work eight hours a day or six hours a day at Google and get massages while on campus and then, you know, go home at 4 p.m. And, and then play video games. So um, something in the middle, I think, would be more um, more reasonable for most folks. I mean, uh, again, I think you should definitely take Aditya and Gauri's word for these things. But um, this is where I'm at actually myself trying to figure out the kind of opportunity that I'll have a couple of years down the line. So just from what I've understood from talking to upperclassmen is that just with an economics degree and someone who is not very interested in academia, because that's always an option. But say you're looking at more business centric things, then if you only have that economics degree without the engineering side of it, that kind of restricts, again, looking at me, myself, if I didn't get like, say, the computer science degree, it would maybe restrict me to more management consulting or investment banking, but maybe less techie based investment banking roles. Whereas if I added that engineering aspect, I think I can, um, you know, look at a lot of different roles that I'm interested in. So I think that's an advantage of having the engineering side. Secondly, just as an economics major at U Chicago, what I've seen is a lot of people here are really interested in startups. And I know you recommended not doing that right out of college, but a good aspect of U Chicago is that we have a really, really strong entrepreneurial setup kind of. There's a whole center that does it. And every year they have, I think, two million, three million, something that they give away to like student run startup. So like every startup every year, you'll hear like five different startups come up. So it's a way that students can try and get into these startups, but before they actually have to take the risk of sacrificing a bit of income to do it. Uh, so I know that's really common for economics majors at U Chicago. I don't know about other places. But yeah. yeah, I'll probably quickly add actually, I would, uh, when it comes to startups, I uh, definitely a good idea to start them out of college, but just go in them with the right intentions. I mean, you should be, uh, it, it'll just make the journey a lot more interesting for you and, as opposed to just, hey, I want to build a social media app and be a CEO. I mean, uh, that shouldn't be the reason to build a startup. But uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm aware of UChicago having a lot of resources for startups. Stanford does as well. I know Berkeley has a couple of accelerators and student-run venture funds. So you know, definitely you know, take advantage of those resources. Uh, joining a startup is also great, right? Because then you can join a company with maybe five to 10 to 15 employees. And um, the benefit of that is it's kind of the best of both worlds, right? You get that entrepreneurial experience, but there's kind of a slightly more seasoned CEO likely to be running the business. But over time, over just maybe two or three years, you could be practically running the place, even though you're, you know, an employee fresh out of college. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I'm sorry about that. I don't know if Robinhood's a thing in India, but a friend of mine joined Robinhood as employee number 11, and they're now um, kind of a what, $15 billion company. So you, you can kind of do the math 
as to how that worked out for him. But he didn't found Robinhood. He joined as employee number 11 or 12, and he's running the entire engineering division right now. So uh, startups are great, actually, because then you're, you're very mission aligned, right? You join a company that truly, truly excites you, and you can kind of have an impact very early on just, just at 22 years old. Or you I could start your own company. I actually just want to like say something also. I feel like um, one thing I, I've realized very quickly is people who graduate from college with a certain degree might not actually end up doing anything with that degree. So like what you take away from your degree is what you want to take away from it. Like I've taken tons of like health econ classes or political econ classes and classes on financial economics and behavioral financial econ. Um, Obviously, I've learned things in this class. I like learned what like a call and a put are and like different options and like how to trade and things like that. But what you put into college is what you get out of it. And I think what I've learned more is like, how do you analyze a problem? Like, how do you break down things? And that's what like what your degree really gives you. It's like, how do you um, when you're given like a case study or something? What are the things that you need to think about? How do you approach it? How do you like write an essay or like how do you persuade someone? How do you like form a, form a strong cohesive argument? And I think those are a lot of the softer skills that you learn. So I would say that like there are definitely people and like now especially companies are tending to like look for people with broader perspectives just because they realize that like you can't just have like econ and CS people running the entire company. So that like if you're afraid that like that's not the path for you like don't worry. Um, things tend to just work out and you find things that you're interested in. So don't like come out of this thinking, I need to like work in one of the roles that we talked about today. You can end up basically wherever and still be, you know, happy with what kind of role you have. Cause I know people who are like a history majors who are working in corporate finance, like people are looking for different perspectives and changes in their lives. So if you, st your major does not define where you end up or what, who you end up working for. Completely agree. I mean, I think you guys really extensively covered all the different options that there are, and I think it's definitely very helpful to um, the people in the, the attendees who do want to pursue economics or computer science or some combination of that in the future. So um, for the final question, um, do you have any tips for current high school students who want to pursue economics in the future? So maybe some general advice. Sorry, I missed that one. I was looking at the, um, the questions on the right side. What's the question again? Do you have any tips for current high school students who want to pursue economics in the future? Actually, stay up, up to date with things. Keep reading. I think that's such an important thing. Keep reading, stay up to date, be aware of things that are happening, be able to hold conversations, read everything you can because I think right now you have the time to read and you have the time to grow your mind. I think one of the skills that I'm grateful I left like school with is having a critical mind and being able to analyze things. So like read books about things that interest you, read The Economist, like get a subscription if you have to, like find ways that you can pursue your passion and don't let don't let there be limitations. I think that especially you're at an age where you have the time to like read books like The Black Swan and things like that and to understand these concepts. So if you are able, read and expand as much as you can into the things that you're interested in. Because I think that I was set on the path of becoming a doctor in my 10th grade and then I realized I don't really care about the pancreas somewhere halfway between studying for my IG bio exam and then I realized I love econ right and then I like read more and I discovered more and I was like why is there an oil crisis right now what's happening and then I read up about it you know like find questions that interest you and keep your mind constantly curious because I think that without like natural curiosity you'll find it really hard to like survive in college just because a lot of things have to come out of you doing things from your for your own interests and your own passion. So never do something because you're not into it. Find ways to keep yourself interested by reading more and expanding your perspective on the world. I mean, I totally agree. Um, a lot of really pursuing economics and uh, in high school is doing things outside school because I think the economics, like the HL class and IB, is quite basic and doesn't isn't the a good reflection of how I've learned economics and university. So I wouldn't base it off that. What I would do is definitely read up. Um, definitely, uh, I had the opportunity to do research at this um, at IAM Bangalore and to literally a TISB friend of mine. His dad was a professor there and I was able to do some research. So there I started to learn a bit more about what economics really is. Um, also, I took part in quite a few competitions which were based on 
economics and business and things of that. So I tried to try to understand things. I did a couple of MUNs which are based on economics, where I started to understand what what if really economics is beyond the IBHL textbook. And um, actually, I learned a lot about just maybe not economics, but really just looking at cost and benefit and trying to analyze things through actually starting things or really working on Vivum. So I think the best way to actually understand maybe economics and more just the way you think is to just go out and do things and take initiatives. So that's my perspective. Great. I mean, thank you guys so much for um, all of your incredible advice. And, you know, you've been through the whole application process, a couple of years of college or finished college. And it's 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 really, really, um, really helpful for us to hear about all of your different experiences, internships, research, networking, academics, the whole thing. So thank you so much for um, spending. Although, I mean, we understand all of you are so busy and Gauri, it's the middle of the night, but Oh, thank you so much. I think much. it's Adityas in the same time zone, so we're both <laughs> up here at like 1.50 <laughs> I mean, so, this has been tough I'm, I'm usually up then, so I'm not complaining that much. <laughs> I was up at 6.30 today. I'm so tired. I feel like I'm the one complaining the most about this time, but I really shouldn't be. But uh, <laughs> I've been getting up at like the mid, mid to late afternoon, so yeah. <laughs> Regardless, I mean, thank you guys so much for spending this time with us and telling us um, so much about your experiences. So and I think um, um, sometimes there are some questions after the session. So in case we do have any, can we please sort of just forward those to your emails? Yeah, 100%. I was about to say that myself. You should feel free to give them my email address and Perfect. I'm happy to follow up with people. Yeah, thank you so much again. And I think we're probably going to end the session here. It has gone a bit over time, but I mean, it was just, we couldn't stop it. It was such incredible advice. Um, yeah, so uh, again, thank you guys so much for spending time with us. And thank you to everyone who attended. Please do send any questions you have to us and we will make sure to forward them um, to Aditya Gaudi and Shikhar. So uh, I think we're just going to end here. Goodbye, everyone. Awesome. Good Thanks night. Very much. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you.